Let the church say amen. <laughs> Let the church say amen again. Amen. amen. So good to see everyone that has came back out um, on this afternoon. We had a wonderful time in the Lord on this morning. Um, Y'all worked me this morning. Man, I, I had to go home and go to sleep. I was tired. <laughs> I, I, but I ate me something. I got to bed. It was OV. I was out for the count. But amen. Amen. We had a wonderful time and the Lord is so glad to see everyone that came back out um, on this afternoon. Have you all been enjoying this series of lessons that we've been in so far? Um, I think it is beneficial for us because as we keep going back over the fact that if you don't understand the importance of every aspect of worship, it's going to be impossible for you to get the best experience out of the worship service. So um, our first lesson, you remember we talked about simply how to get the most out of the worship service. And then on last week, we talked about how to get the most out of our singing. So on tonight, of course, we are dealing with another important part of our worship service, and that has to do with the Lord's Supper, the communion, the Eucharist, whatever you want to call it, it's talking about the Lord's Supper. So tonight we know the scripture that we have, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, um, verses 23 through 30. And I told Sister Coffee, I said, I'm going to get up, speak up, shut up, and sit down. So let's see if I know how to do that. <laughs> Amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, uh, verses 23 through 30. <laughs> For I have received of the Lord. That which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament of my blood, this do ye as often as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat of this bread and drink of this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat of this bread and drink of this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthy, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many are asleep. Now, we know that the Lord's Supper, the communion, is an important part of our worship service. And the Lord's Supper, the communion, that time, it deserves your full attention and your full respect, just like you do in any other part of our worship service to God. Now, the Lord's Supper has always been important to Christians. And in my study, um, it's good to not just go um, from a scriptural basis, but it's good to go back and read the ancient writings of other people that were alive during that time, people that also they have writers and things that even though they aren't included in scripture, they correlate and they help you to prove what it is that the Bible has to say. So as I was looking um, and, and, um, and we realized that the early church fathers, they had something to say. And one thing that they all agreed on is that the Lord's Supper was taken every week on the first day of the week. Now, these were people that did not even believe on God necessarily, but from the onset, them just looking at how the early Christians acted, the, the ordinances of the early Christians, they understood that the first day of the week was the day set aside for the people of God to partake of the Lord's Supper. Now, if you find a week that ain't got a first day, then you ain't got to take it. Now, not only should the Lord's Supper be taken every first day of the week, but it should be observed according to the scripture. But this doesn't always happen. In fact, some of the Christians in the first century had already started to corrupt the Lord's Supper. And Paul came down there and he rebuked those folk. Paul said in 1 Corinthians, um, this is 17 to 22 leading up to where we are. Paul says it like this. He says, now in giving these instructions, I do not praise you since you come together not for the better, but for the worse. For first of all, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you and I in part believe it. For there must also be factions among you that those who are approved may be recognized among you. Therefore, when you come together in one place, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in eating, each one takes his own supper ahead of the others. And one is hungry and another is drunk. What? 
Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? Paul says, I do not praise you. Now, these Christians had turned the Lord's Supper into a feast. Now, we have some brethren that look at this scripture and they take it to the extreme and they say, well, you're not supposed to eat in the building. That's not, that is not what the Bible is saying at all. That is not what the scripture is referring to. These people had simply turned the sacred Lord's Supper into a feast. Hey, you bring a pot pie. You bring some chitlins. You bring some collard greens. You got the cornbread. They had turned the Lord's Supper into a feast. And not only were they eating, but they were getting drunk. Yeah. 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 And it was every man for himself. And they had gone back to their old ways because there are a lot of that pagan worship going on in the city where they had done this before. But as Paul told them what they were doing, this ain't the Lord's Supper. This ain't what God would have y'all to do. Now, if they continue to defile the supper, Paul says in verse number 27, Therefore, whosoever eats this bread and drink this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. Now, this was a serious offense. And Paul said in, in verses 29 and 30, For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks in judgment or in damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many are asleep. Now, while we may never get to the point of abusing the Lord's Supper, as these Christians did in the first century, don't nobody come bringing no pot pies and collard greens up in here, all right? Now, I don't think we ever get to that place, but we need to be sure that we are doing it in the proper manner because if we are not careful, we can turn the Lord's Supper into what we'll say a mindless activity. Yes. Amen. Now, if we count it just as a common thing, then we are not partaking of the Lord's Supper in a worthy manner. And Paul's rebuke will apply to us as well. Now, this is why it's important that we partake the Lord's Supper with our minds in the right place. Look at somebody say, your mind need to be in the right place. Our minds need to be in the right place when we do it, because when we do it right, you'll get the most out of it. I said, when you do it the right way, you will give the most out of it. You will be blessed in your spirit. You will be uplifted. Now, to help us get the most out of the Lord's Supper, let's look at what the Bible says about the Lord's Supper. And the first thing I want to point out about the Lord's Supper is that it is a memorial. Yes, sir. It is a memorial that reminds us of what Jesus did for us. Now, memorials have always been important throughout the Bible. And many times you will read, especially in the Old Testament, of how the children of Israel would set up a memorial of what God had did for them. Now, for example, when you go back, Joshua had them to set up 12 stones to serve as a reminder of how God allowed them to cross the, 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 the Jordan River on dry ground. That was in Joshua chapter 4. And also under the Old Testament, the Passover was the memorial observed every year by the Jews. They still do it to this day so they could be reminded of how they were delivered from Egypt by God and how their firstborn males were spared by putting the blood of the lamb on either side of the doorpost. And in the same way, the Lord's Supper is a memorial of what Jesus did for us and how he died for us. Now, notice what Jesus said when he instituted the Lord's Supper in Matthew chapter 26. Verses 26 to 28, it says, And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take and eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sin. So when we eat the unleavened bread, we need to remember that what it represents. What does it represent? The body of Christ. And we need to think about what his physical body went through for us. And how much love he had for us to allow his body to be put to death on a cross for our sins. Now, when we drink the fruit of the vine, 
we need to think about how Jesus was willing to shed his blood for us so that we could have the forgiveness of sin. And, and so the new covenant could be put into the place because in order for the new covenant to come into place, they had to first of all be the shedding of innocent blood. So by the death of Christ, by his dying on the cross, by the shedding of his blood, the new covenant was able to be in effect. He put a down, he didn't just put a down payment, he paid for the body of Christ. He purchased the church with the shedding of his innocent blood on Calvary's hill. Now, Paul said something in Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 9. He says, so, for when we were still without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man some would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were what? Yet sinners. What did he do? Christ died for us. Much more then, having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Now, as we partake of the Lord's Supper, we need to concentrate on having our minds on what Jesus did, even though we didn't deserve it. Come on, man. There are many different ways that we can do this. First of all, you can simply use your imagination and picture in your mind how Jesus lived a perfect, sin-free life for us and how he was willing to endure the scourging, the beatings, and the suffering he endured on the cross. And we can imagine how all those Jews had turned their back on Jesus, yet he was willing to die for them and all of us. And finally, you can imagine how painful it was for Jesus as he had to be separated from his father for the first time in his life because he was being sacrificed for all of our sins. Second, we can take out our Bible and read passages like Isaiah 53. Read passages like Psalms 22 or New Testament packages that we're talking about what Jesus did for us. And third, even as we talk about, you can open up a song book. Look at the hymns that have to do with the Lord's Supper and read those words, actually get the meaning of what it is that Christ did and you'll get a more in-depth meaning and a respect for the communion for the Lord's Supper. Now all of these things can be helpful, but what is important is for you to figure out what works best for you. How am I going to be able to focus myself more? How am I going to be able to pay attention more? And how am I really going to be able to take this thing serious? Now, another um, a way for us to get the most out of the communion is for us to realize that this is a proclamation of Jesus' death until he comes again. Yes. Until he comes back. This is the proclamation of his death. Now, Paul said, again, in our text today, he said, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Now, when we partake of the Lord's Supper, we are letting people know Jesus died for our sins. That's what you're saying. Jesus died for our sins, and we are also proclaiming our faith in Jesus until that day that he comes back to receive his own. Now, until that day happens, we need to continue to proclaim his death every week. I didn't say monthly. I didn't say quarterly. I didn't say annually, semi-annually. Some folk do it neverly. But I say on a weekly basis, on a weekly basis, we are to be partaking of the Lord's Supper. Now, when, when your children see you doing this every Sunday, they'll understand that the Lord's Supper was something that was important to mom and daddy. Amen. Mom and daddy, they took that every week. I never, I didn't know what it meant, but I know mom and daddy, they commune with the Lord every week. And they will ask you as they get older, what I got to do to get some of that juice in that cracker? You know, that, that's the question that they ask. What I got to do to be able to get some of that? And once that question has been asked, now you have the opportunity to share Jesus. Now the door has been opened that you can share that with your child so that they can have an actual understanding of what it is that I'm doing when I commune with the Lord. Now, another, uh, and uh, Paul said that with the, the cup of blessing, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse number 16, he says that the cup of blessing which we bless is it not the communion 
communion of the blood of Christ. The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? Now, according to Paul, we are participating and we are fellowshipping with the blood of Christ. And his body, when we partake of the Lord's Supper, which is why only Christians should partake of it. Which is why only Christians should partake of it because a non-Christian cannot be in fellowship with Jesus. Is that right? Now, if we can imagine in our minds that we are in direct fellowship with Jesus as we partake of the Lord's Supper, it will cause us to appreciate it and we're going to take this thing serious. I'm not just tossing it up. I'm not just waiting on the communion because, man, I ain't have time to stop and get breakfast. It's just going to be a little something that's just going to give me a little, hold me over at least till I get up out of here. No, that's not what it's about. But this is a serious matter that it is a privilege for me to be able to take up the body, to be able to take up the blood because in doing so I am saying he died for me he rose for me and guess what one day he's coming back for me now another thing that we got to do is to consider the warning that Paul gave remember the warning that the apostle Paul gave in verse number 27 therefore whoever eats this bread and drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord now the last thing we should want as Christians is to be guilty of the blood of Christ by not partaking of the Lord's Supper in a worthy manner some have misunderstood this passage to mean that we must be worthy to partake of the Lord's Supper. But if that were the case, none of us would be able to partake of it. Because none of us are worthy of anything from the Lord. But thankfully, though God's grace, all, through Christian, all true Christians have been reconciled to God through the death of Jesus Christ, which gives us the privilege and the honor to be able to partake of the Lord's Supper. Now, what Paul had in mind here is that we are not supposed to take it in an unworthy manner. Of the course, the immediate example of how these Christians had, com they had completely corrupted it. But what we can do the same if we are not partaking it, here it is, with the right attitude. Not only with the right attitude, but you got to take it for the right reason. So reminding ourselves of how serious we should be when we partake of the Lord's Supper will help us to really be able to focus on what it is that we are doing. Now, verse number 28 says, but let a man examine himself. Before I even have the opportunity to crack open the seal, I ought to be examining myself. Okay, Lord, do, do, do I need to repent before I take it? Do, 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 is there something in my life that is not right that I know if I take this, it's going to be in damnation to my soul? So before you even take, you ought to be in communion with yourself. Amen. Okay, this, this, okay Lord, Thank you, Jesus. do I need to take this? You know, I, you, I'm examining my life. I know where I am. I know what I am. Do I need to be partaking of this? So the Lord's Supper is a time of reflection. It's a time of reflection on how you've been living so far. How you've been living recently in your Christian life. Have you been faithful that week? Or do you have sins that you need to be taken care of? Now, when we think about Jesus dying on the cross and forgiving us of our sins and how he has made it possible for us to continue to have forgiveness of, of the sins that we have now, if we allow it, the Lord's Supper can help us to remain faithful to God. And to never forget that our ultimate goal in everything that we do is to honor what he did on the cross. And we do that in our communion. We do that in the Lord's Supper. We honor the sacrifice that he made in the giving of his life. And the last thing that will help us to get the most out of our communion time is to realize that we are also in fellowship with our brothers and sisters in Christ. Paul, when he got on to these folk down there at the Corinthian church, he said, you know what? He said, one of the problems that I have with y'all is that you ain't waiting on the other people. This is something that you do in community with one another. And he said, yeah, and he said, man, you already over there eating, one that got drunk already, and somebody over here, they still hungry, somebody over here, they still thirsty. Y'all ain't waiting on nobody. 
So Paul said, you need to remember that you are in fellowship with your brothers and sisters in Christ, which is why Paul taught that we ought to partake it together. Partake of it together. That's why you say, man, I, I just go to church at the house. You know, I, I go and give me some saltines and some Welch's grape juice. You know, I do. No, that is not the same thing because you are not partaking of it together in fellowship with your brothers and your sisters in Christ. And when we assemble with the saints, we make up the one body of Christ, the church of Christ, that he purchased with his own blood. And when we partake of it together, we get, guess what we get to show? We get to show our unity. We get to show, and it is a powerful thing when we are able to come together and be in fellowship with each other and with God and be able to honor Jesus by eating the bread and drinking the fruit of the vine. Reminding ourselves of the great privilege that we have been given by God and it should help us to be able to get the most out of the time that we have to commune with God. I want you to allow this to sink deep into your heart. So that the next time you have the opportunity to, to commune with God, that you're going to understand the depth of what it means. You're going to understand the seriousness of it, that this is not something that's just a formality. It is not something that we, you know, we've been just been doing it so long, you know, we just keep on doing it. But it is important. It is an important part of our worship service. The Bible says that upon the first day of the week, when they came together to do what? Break bread. Break bread. And Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow. And Trevante keep on preaching till midnight. Is that what it said? That what it said? All right, turn your Bibles. No, 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 no. <laughs> Amen. Understanding the meaning, understanding the depth of what it was that Christ did when he gave his life, when he shed his blood for us, understanding the depth of that will help us to be in a place that we'll never take it in an unworthy manner. Because we'll always be examining ourselves, saying, man, I don't want to take this in damnation to myself. Man, just y'all going to pass me. I don't need it right now. I know I, know I don't need it. I ain't even going to pick it up. We want to always be in a place to where we are worthy. We want to be in a place that we are worthy to receive the blessings of God. Amen. If you're here um, on this afternoon or maybe you're watching us and you're not a Christian, you're not a member of the body of Christ, um, you have not yet had your sins washed away by the blood of the Lamb, you come by hearing his word, believing the same, repenting of your sins, confessing Christ as your Savior, being buried with him in baptism, have your sins washed away, eradicated, done away with, never to come up before you in this life and neither the life that is to come. And according to Acts chapter 2 and verse number 47, the Lord himself will add you to his body. And, and after that moment, um, you are to remain faithful until death. And he said, if you remain faithful unto death, he said, I give you a crown of life that will never fade away. You'll be able to say like Paul, say, you know what, I fought a good fight. I finished my course. I've kept the faith. Henceforth now there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness, but not only for me, but for all those who love Christ and his appearing. Maybe you're here and maybe you're watching. You're standing in the need of prayer. Allow us to pray for you today because the prayers of the righteous, they still avail it much. So if you're subject to the invitation, why not take this opportunity now as together we stand and sing the song of invitation.